Niners risk their lives every day keeping us safe. You're putting yourself out there to help other people at their most precious time of need. But all too often, they're abused and attacked. Their house is on fire and they're attacking us. I was standing up with her hands around my throat. These personal attacks on police, paramedics and firefighters are at an all-time high. Shots fired, shots fired. Are you telling me I'm going to kill your wife and I'm going to kill your family and I'm going to kill you? Leaving them traumatised and unable to work. How do you come to terms with knowing that you can't go and do the job that you love? But while the violent criminals responsible are hunted down and brought to justice, Shut our protectors fight to get well and back on the job. We kept people safe. We'll put away the bad guys. I'm not going to let some man ruin it for me. This is my future. This is what I enjoy doing. Ready to face the next critical incident. Coming up, a police officer shot at close range risks losing his sight. Almost immediately, John says, I've been shot. I knew I'd been shot in the face and I could feel the blood. A motorcyclist causes mayhem as he speeds through the streets. And we're back with PC Claire Bond, who was left seriously injured after being driven into by a car. He started reversing the car, dragging me down the fence. But one year on, she's ready to return to the job she loves. He did really, really well. It's really, really good. I'm trying to go back to work with a better version of myself. John King and Kevin Mulligan have been friends for 40 years. As well as growing up together, they both chose the same career path. You right, son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. I was a Brit for six years, and uh, my dad, my dad was a, a police officer, and uh, I can remember one Christmas coming home, uh, I hadn't laid any bricks, didn't have any money, uh, hadn't really thought about the police. My dad said, why don't, why don't you give it, you know, give it a try? He loved being in the police. We uh, grew up in, uh, in the same kind of town, uh, had the same kind of interests, uh, music, um, same circle of friends, really. And uh, so from early teens, we, we knew each other. Then he, John joined the police, um, and five years after that, I joined the police. If you spend eight hours in a car with somebody, you spend more time with them than you'd, than you'd spend with your wife. It's a support network as well, isn't it? You'll go to a job, somebody's been badly injured or, you know, something to do with a child, and you support each other, don't you? This friendship was a huge comfort to them both during the aftermath of the most distressing event of their careers. We got really close from doing the job from doing that the job, yeah, we yeah. loved. Um, there's a connect that, and a bond that... Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a bond that... Because you've been through it. You've job, been through yeah. something that yeah, you don't, no one else should have yeah. to go through. It was October 2014, and John and Kevin were on a night shift. That's the balcony there, isn't it? Yep. Well, that's it. Yeah. It's weird sitting here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I do remember looking over the edge of that balcony and thinking, I need to jump off here. A call came in to attend a residential address. It was a mental health patient who hadn't been taking his medication. His family had rung in, worried about him. Um, and he and they couldn't gain access to his flat. In these cases, no one really wants to use force unless it's absolutely necessary. John and myself were standing on the landing of this, uh, this flat um, and communicating with the guy that was behind the door. We were telling him we weren't there to hurt him and we weren't there to hurt him. We were there to, to get him, you know, get him mental health help. We got to the point where communications and dialogue had proven fruitless, uh, so we took the decision to force entry. I hit the door a couple of times, but it was it was a plastic door and it just wasn't going through. So I stepped back and then uh, Kev started hitting the door. It's a UPVC door, it's new. So rather than go for the, the lock or the hinges, there's a panel in the centre. So I thought if I could create a void in the panel, 
we could at least start some dialogue with the individual. And we meant business, really, in his best interest to, to secure him out. Kevin smashed a small hole in the door, but before they could begin a conversation, things spiralled out of control. Almost immediately, John says, I've been shot. And I, I'll never forget those words, I've been shot. I just felt the, um, just a, a crashing blow on my right eye. I knew I'd been shot in the face and I could feel, I could feel the blood on my face. And I knew I had to get off the balcony. We had to get him past the door, by which time it had obviously got a big hole in it. And, and he was still firing. He was still firing yeah. out at us. We had to get past that and get John down the steps. I thought about jumping off, off the balcony, but I realised that I was going to get possibly, you know, worse injuries jumping off. Meanwhile, the gunman shot again through the hole in the door. And he shot again, and the second shot, as I turned to the side to go down the steps, hit me just to the side of my left eye and glanced, luckily, across my eyeball and didn't go into my eye socket. Fortunately for John, an ambulance was already on the scene. I can remember a young lad, a young paramedic, jumping into the back, looking at me and saying, you know, he was, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I can remember saying to him, you tell me th that I look all right. And, and he said, you look all right, you look all right. John had been shot in the eye with a rubber ball from a paintball gun. Now Kevin had to make sure that no one else got hurt. John went off on the ambulance. Now that left me in a situation because um, I've still got a duty to protect the public and protect the, the guy that's in the flat. Um, but it's, it's serious business now. Did you call the, firearms then, then, did you? Yeah, so we, we shouted up on the radio what had gone on. Uh, team came. The instructions they gave him, he abided by, and he came out very calm. It was over very quickly. John was rushed to the hospital as quickly as possible. At home, his wife Lisa, also a police officer, knew nothing about the incident. I was at home with the children. John had gone to work a night shift, as always, and um, there, was, there was a knock on the door which everybody kind of dreads, um, don't they, in the middle of the night. And being a police officer and then opening the door to a police officer, I kind of knew it was bad news. That's not anything that any of us ever want to do, uh, knock on the front door of a colleague, of a friend, um, and tell their partner or loved one that uh, there's been an incident of that magnitude. He'd been at the scene, so he, he would have seen that it wasn't very pleasant to look at. So he kind of tried to prepare me a little bit. He said, well, we really don't know how bad his eye is. We really don't know whether he's going to lose his eye. Um, I don't think it's it necessarily sunk in to start with. And it was only when I was in the car and we were going over to uh, Birmingham Eye Hospital, where he was uh, taken to, that it kind of started sinking in. So I got a little bit worked up then, thinking, because obviously he'd gone in his eye, and I'm thinking, is his face going to be all injured? And just thinking the worst, really. When we walked through the door, he had covering over it. So immediately I'm thinking, oh, how bad is this? Um, but at that time, we didn't know the severity of, of what had happened. Later, doctors struggled to save John's sight. The damage was far worse than they'd, they'd expected, and there was probably not a, a lot of chance of me being able to see through it. It's not just police officers who put their lives at risk in the line of duty. Service animals like police dogs also face danger. In 2019, a new law was passed to protect such animals. Finn's law was inspired by brave police dog Finn, who was stabbed along with his handler, PC Wardell, in 2016. This footage from 2019 highlights just how important the role of the police dog is in catching criminals. Northumbria police receive a report of a burglary in a shop. Two men had forced entry and tried to steal some cigarettes. Their vehicle was found abandoned 30 miles away, and it was up to police dog Max and his officer to find any suspects or evidence. Max tracked the surrounding area and successfully located vital pieces of evidence, including a balaclava, clothing, and gloves hidden in undergrowth nearby. Good boy. 
Forensics from the Balaclava help secure a conviction and put a burglar behind bars. PC Fegan of the Forces Dog Section said, Max has had a lot of very good jobs, but this is right up there with one of the best. The thief was convicted of burglary at Newcastle Crown Court. He was sentenced to 23 weeks in prison. Vehicles in the wrong hands can be as dangerous as any weapon. And one person who knows the damage vehicles can do more than most is PC Claire Bond. We first met Claire 15 months ago, shortly after she'd been mowed down by a criminal driver she was trying to arrest. This is the fence that he's pinned me up against, uh, and he's reversed down this pathway and has literally uh, dragged me back along here. Um, all the way to the bottom, where the car has flipped me out. The incident occurred in September 2018. Claire and her partner received a call about a reckless driver on the streets of Stafford. We found out that the 10k um, Stafford run was on that day. We were quite concerned because of the runners. I've never had a pursuit where somebody it, it literally will not stop for anything. The whole time, thousands of people that were running up the road and there was, there was clearly no way he would have stopped. Claire and Dave pursued the car for some minutes before it eventually crashed and came to a stop. But when Claire tried to take the car keys off the driver, he took drastic action. When he started reversing the car, um, dragging me down the fence, and I, not, I it was like I was in a washing machine. It was, my, my body was just like turning. Then all of a sudden, I, I felt a quite a hard hit. And I remember thinking, my legs hurt. Clearly in lots and lots of pain, so there was, there was nothing I could do. I just had to hold her. Claire's right knee was split open, and the bones in her left leg were shattered. Been, uh, it's been quite a rough road for, for all of us. It's quite difficult doing that to a fit woman, you know, who days before was, was able-bodied. And now, like, you know, I literally had to look after her like, you know, she was completely paralysed. There you go. 12 months after the incident, the offender was jailed for 12 years and nine months for causing grievous bodily harm with intent to resist arrest and other offences. PC Claire Bond has been left physically and emotionally scarred after trying to protect the public. PC Bond gave this response to his sentence. I've been a police officer for nearly 18 years and never before have I met anybody with such disregard for another human being. Claire Bond credits her colleague, PC Dave Mullins, with saving her life. I was really nervous. The first time I've gone to Crown Court the judge asked me to read my victim personal statement. And when I was doing so, he listened to every word. What mattered is that I was heard. That was a huge part uh, that I could then put to bed. But although the trial was over, Claire's rehabilitation was only just beginning. I was so positive in my mental attitude up until probably June last year, where I noticed quite a dip in how I was feeling. I started my counselling, and with that I mean um, some specialist trauma work. Not many people know the symptoms of PTSD. The latter six months of 2019 was um, a further few operations 
um, which kind of was like one step forward, two step back. Claire still has a mountain to climb, but she's persevering. It's one year on since the incident, and she's back at the Stafford 10K. But this time, she's participating in the event. She's raising funds for the police charity, COPS, and hopes to walk the last kilometre. I'm excited. I woke up this morning excited. I think uh, the whole point of doing it, not only to raise money, but it's, uh, kind of to give me and Dave a bit of closure. A lot of people have, um, have been saying hi and waving. We've had um, donations already. I'm not shy when it comes to raising uh, a few funds, so... My phone just keeps pinging of people saying, look, just do what you can, but I'm adamant that I'm going to cross the line. Yeah, I'm proud of us as a group. Um, I'm proud of, of where Dave's come from, uh, and we've... We've really made a good friendship out of this. Yeah, certainly. Definitely a friendship from this that I didn't have with it before. So that's the sort of thing you've got to look for, really, that positives out of these things that happen. Uh, Darren and Dave are going to run off and do the 10K, catch me up at around about nine, and then we'll all walk uh, across the line together. It's just nice to sort of draw a line under it and certainly be a different experience to what it was for them, so. um, It's nice for us to smile about it um, and for Darren to do the run and for us all to just come together. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. First time since Claire's horrific attack, she is walking one kilometre, and the people of Stafford are all cheering for her. Thanks. Keep it safe. Thank you. Don't the fact that these people have run all this way and they're saying, "Come on, Claire!" It's just amazing. I wasn't expecting that. My legs are shaking. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. An event like that just brings everyone together. People just supporting each other, and I think that's a good community spirit. wiped the slate clean of what happened a year ago, which was so dark, to then this year being so uplifting. I'm just in awe, really. I'm on top of the world. I think it's gone better than th th that we ever envisaged, to be fair. I'm We've done it, they've done it. I'm so proud of Dave and, and Darren for running all that way. I feel like I've run the whole 10K myself. It's another personal goal uh, completed. Later, we catch up with Claire as she works hard to achieve her next goal, getting back to work. I got quite emotional, really, because they're things that I want to start taking for granted again. Police do have a useful tool in their armoury to fight vehicle crime, the Stinger. 
A Stinger is a device deployed to stop dangerous drivers in their tracks. In this footage, a motorcyclist speeds away when police try to stop him after noticing that he was acting suspiciously and driving dangerously. Police pursue the motorbike as it drives recklessly, mounting pavements, cutting across roundabouts and riding on the wrong side of the road, putting everyone in danger. The police were authorised to use tactical contact to stop the motorcyclist. They then use a stinger to successfully end the pursuit. The driver pleaded guilty to dangerous driving, driving without a license or insurance, and other offences. He was jailed for eight months and banned from driving for 18 months. Still to come, police officer John King sustains a life-changing injury, but the support of his family and friends helps him heal. I love him. I really do love you. And I love you, mate. You know I do. Yeah, I love you too. John's probably the only person that's kept the optimism up. And a stint in the police treatment centre prepares Claire Bond for returning to work. I think what I've got to realise is that, that I'm still the same person and that I'm proud of myself. She's looking towards the future. She's looking towards that goal. In Cannock, John King has been shot in the eye as he tried to help a man suffering with severe mental health issues. Unknown to John and his colleagues, the man was armed. I knew I'd been shot in the face and I could feel, I could feel the blood on my face. And I, I'll never forget those words, I've been shot. While he was rushed to hospital, John's wife Lisa was contacted with the news. He said, well, we really don't know how bad his eye is. We really don't know whether he's going to lose his eye. And I think you need to come to the hospital. John was transferred to the Birmingham Midland Eye Centre. They operated on me the first full day I was there. And what they'd done is they'd, they'd managed to stitch my battered eyeball back together. They'd got everything that goes inside an eyeball, like your lens and everything, and they'd put it all back in and then just stitched it back together. They had said to me, though, the damage was far worse than they'd, they'd expected, and there was probably not a, a lot of chance of me being able to see through it. John can't remember a lot of that week because of the medication that he was on. I obviously was at home at night time with the children while he was in hospital, and he'd be phoning me at three in the morning, just sobbing and really upset, um, but he can't remember doing that. It was more traumatic than he perhaps remembers at the time, but um, it wasn't very pleasant to hear that. John spent the next few months at home, hoping his eye would heal and that he might regain some of his vision. The eye was really painful. It was slight, it was smaller than my other eye, and also it was just, it was just white, really. I was having to help him with his medication, and put eye cream in and stuff like that because he couldn't do everything himself. He was in, he's awake most nights in pain, which again, he can't remember, but he was. So of course I'm awake. And then I had a lot of eye tests just to see if anything, I'd got any vision at all, but nothing had come back. Um, I then made the decision because it was painful. I decided just to have the eye removed because the, the pain was just, it wasn't, it wasn't going away. Once John's mind was made up, surgery was arranged immediately. Using cutting-edge technology, doctors placed a hand-painted eye into John's eye socket. I think the way that he helped himself initially was through a video diary of the emotions. I've been out of surgery for about three hours. I've just spoke to my surgeon who carried it out, and he's saying it went really, really well. They've removed most of my blind eye. Uh, put the old ping pong ball in, they put a cover on it. He's saying it looks shape-wise great, which I'm happy about, uh, and I'm over the moon. And then what they do is they put a prosthetic uh, implant in, the same shape as, 
an eyeball, and then they sew the skin around it. And that, that just means that my eye moves. It doesn't move as much as my good eye, but it's, it's close enough. John now has a routine to help maintain his prosthetic eye. A painless procedure that involves removing it and keeping it clean. It has to, it's supposed to be polished about every two, three years, but I, I just find that as long as I keep, as long as I keep it and myself clean, uh, it's been fine. When he takes that eye out, he's unrecognisable, you know. And there are times, because of comfort, that he would like to take it out, because it, it is like having a foreign body in your body, really, so he would like to take it out but then he doesn't like how he looks, so it's, it's sort of a catch-22 there. The loss of John's eye has had a huge impact on his life. Socially, he will avoid crowds at all costs because he, he just feels a nuisance, and he'll say that. If I don't see you, I don't, I don't move enough, so I, I do bump into people, which, is, which can be a pain, so crowds are a bit of a game. He gets all disorientated if he's pushed around and stuff, and that doesn't help his mood. Um, so it's quite, it has been quite stressful in some places to be around him. At the time of the incident, John's children were very young. My little lad, who was five at the time, it hit him quite hard and his school suffered a bit. There was a time that he, he didn't want to be in the same room as John. So trying to juggle that and trying to get him to bond again with Daddy was, was difficult, you know, it's emotional. John's son, Will, who is now 10, can still recall the trauma of his dad being injured. It was quite shocking, really, to believe that he was alive, cos I'd gone without seeing him, apart from my news from Mom, I'd thought he was dead. I was really sad about my dad and always worried that something would happen to him, as, he would, as he'd just been injured. What if something happened again? And what if he wouldn't get better this time? What if he wouldn't wake up again? Two years after the incident, John and his team attended the trial of the offender. John King left Stafford Cram Court with the three officers with him when he was shot and blinded by rubber balls from a paintball gun. In a finding of fact hearing due to the offender's mental ill health, the jury found the offender had caused grievous bodily harm and had been in possession of a prohibited firearm. He was given an indefinite hospital order. I've, I've got no animosity. I met his I met his mom at the court case and put my arm around her. She's had a, a lifetime of this. He was poorly mentally. He was poorly, and although his family were fantastic around him, and I know that, having met them, there's only so much they can do to make him take medication, which he hadn't done. So it was unfortunate for him that he'd got himself in that situation. But you know about the guy that did it, that he wasn't yeah. taking his medication, that yeah. he didn't. He didn't mean to hurt and, uh, anybody. And, and and I forgive him, you forgive yeah, him. Yeah, absolutely. I don't I don't see any reason why like other people shouldn't forgive him because he couldn't help it. He wasn't in control at that point. Therefore it's not his fault. Another person who was deeply affected by the incident was John's friend and colleague, Kevin Mulligan. I wouldn't wish it on me worst enemy. No, no. No. But it could have been a lot worse. That's how, how cops look at it, isn't it? Could have been a lot worse. Cops, it could have been, could have been a lot worse. He could have got just more than me. Uh, there isn't a day goes by I don't think about it. There isn't a day go by I feel guilty because it wasn't me that got shot, and because I was at the front. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, that's just something I'm going to have to live with, really. As John and Kevin revisit the scene of the incident. John feels he's gained some closure. Having now retired, this is the place where he carried out his final policing duties. It's taken me back to a previous life, but a life that I loved, because of course, from, from the night of the shooting, I, I never went back to it. And I loved the police, absolutely loved every second of it. So it, I feel sad that, 
that it all came to an end then, but, you know, life moves on. It wasn't easy to see John coming to the end of his career in such circumstances, um, because he was Job, he was Job through and through. I just think it's a shame that I'm not... Um, that he'll never remember, really, when it, as he grows up, ab about me b being a police officer. It's, it's quite vivid in my memory. Well, that's good. Your days as a police officer, so I don't think I'll forget it any time soon. You can't live your life on um, regrets. You've got to, we've not. just got to accept it, it thankfully. Yeah, uh, thankfully. We're, we're, here, we're here to tell the tale. But John has managed to find a new passion in his life. I think uh, playing the guitar saved me, really, because that was something that I'd always done. It's a great big stress relief and comforter to be able to lose yourself with an instrument. When I got out of hospital, um, I'd actually bought myself like a little recording desk and uh, I wrote an, an album in about two weeks. Been writing ever since. And that's, that's from 20 years of not writing anything. So, I, you know, it wasn't worth losing an eye for, but it, it's, it really has helped me. In all of it, John's probably the only person that's kept the optimism up, you know, and, and he's been the person that's lifted everybody's spirits around it. I really admire him for that. <laughs> cheers, pal. Yeah, cheers, good. I love him like a brother. Uh, that's not going to change. Uh, and we miss him terribly. But um, what he did for uh, us as a, as a service, and certainly as a team, uh, won't be forgotten, and uh, we've been carrying on in his memory in that way. I love him. I really do love you, and if anything happened to you, even if it was just, like, a, a little, like... Splinter? A little splinter, I'd, I'd still really, really worry about you. Well, you don't need to worry about me, and I love you, mate, you know I do. Yeah, I love you, you too. Nice. In 2017 to 18, the West Midlands experienced the biggest hike in knife crime in any part of the country outside London. Two West Midlands police officers were on plainclothes patrols last year when the force received a flurry of 999 calls reporting a man in a Birmingham street with a two foot long blade. Despite being unarmed, the two officers on spotting the man with a weapon gave chase for around half a mile. They eventually wrestled the knife man to the floor and disarmed him. He was also found to be in possession of a log knife. Both officers went on to receive commendations from the chief constable. The offender admitted possessing an offensive weapon and making threats with a bladed article and was given an indefinite hospital order under the Mental Health Act. Back in Stafford, PC Claire Bond is recovering from a serious injury, having been knocked down by a car following a pursuit. Thanks ever so much. I can't see anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she has just walked the last kilometre of the Stafford 10K to mark the passing of exactly one year since the incident. This is the first time that Claire has walked this far in 12 months, and it's been a huge boost for her. I'm on top of the world. I think it's gone better than th that we ever envisaged, to be fair. It's another personal goal uh, completed. Come on. Come on. This week, Claire received some news about her prognosis. Wednesday, I went down to see a knee specialist in London. And he, uh, he was quite blunt and said, I, it's unlikely that you'll be able to go back front line. I think I knew deep down that whether Claire would be able to go back front line or not, I, I would never want her to, I don't think. I, I just, I don't. 
it just would, wouldn't sit right, and I don't think the kids would want to. I know our, our older children don't want her to go back frontline. Although she can't go back to frontline policing, Claire still wants to go back to work. She has decided to attend the police treatment centre in Harrogate, where she hopes the rehabilitation programme will help her injuries to heal quicker. You're going to push that knee, bent knee away from you. My two weeks here is for me to see how far I can push myself. Each and every time, it's lifted me up to come to a place like this and have the facilities to use uh, has, has been a lifesaver, really. At the treatment centre, Claire has access to high-tech machinery like this anti-gravity treadmill, which will help her to regain her mobility. Pull that lever across there. You then drop it. This should come out backwards. And then what you do is stand on that one to get in. That's it. Use your hand. So this is an Alter-G treadmill, and this is going to reduce the gravity that's going to be on Claire's legs. So the point of it is, is that being able to do activities, but with less weight, basically. We're just going to press that green button to press start. It's going to calibrate. You're going to feel it blow, and then it'll come down and then blow again. Just try and stay as still as you can. What we're hoping is that when you're walking, you find it easier to have a normal walking pattern. And that's where, actually, pacing your rehab, which is what this is doing, by reducing the, the gravity, so reducing the load on that area. It's a bit like going to the gym and starting doing your biceps with one kilogram, not trying to start on five. Yeah. So you can use that as, as an element of a goal setting. There is no doubt that Claire is throwing herself into her recovery. She's even had a visit from the centre's therapy dog. Anne has been bringing her therapy dogs to the centre for four and a half years. Her dogs are trained to provide affection, support and comfort to people who are ill or have experienced trauma. You automatically want to put your arms around his neck and give him a good old cuddle. Yeah, they're very de-stressing. You can't argue with a dog and they give you unconditional love. Yeah. I know he's got a lovely temperament, but we socialise him a lot to meet other people and dogs. Yeah. And you get an idea from the word go if they're going to be all right to do this. What's this boy called? Reckless. Reckless. And where did that come from? Well, our other ones are riot, mayhem, carnage, and the new puppy is going to be havoc. But we do feel a bit silly in the field, shouting, riot, carnage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. I needed a wash. Just going to get a little bit more elaborate with that each time. Claire's movement is improving all the time. Part of my rehabilitation, the, the balance, the walking on uh, different surfaces, the bending down, it's, it's been a huge eye-opener as to what we take for granted. It's not until you've gone through something that's impacted on your mobility that you realise that you do take these things for granted. I see people in the classes jumping off things and they're, they're all things that I cannot do at the moment. So what we'll do is we'll go back down to the floor, feel free, and then just back through that knee. Excellent, good control. It's all right, they did really, really well. It's really, really good. It takes a lot, a lot of a big, big, big amount of effort to do that. It was good. OK? Good. All right. I, I got quite emotional, really, because they're things that I want to start taking for granted again. And uh, being able to just do without actually thinking, uh, can, can my legs take it or not? And clearly, they can. Where I said, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm not really keen on that. I think they're the ones I've got to try and uh, work harder at. I, I, I am extremely proud of myself. It's very difficult for me to say that. Go into a class like that and actually start to feel stronger about myself. And I think that these next two weeks, I can do that here. I can push perhaps to even more than I thought I'm capable of.
So this one's moving really easily. This bit still feels a bit tight, but I'm aware that if I keep going, it's probably just going to be quite sore. So I'm actually going to leave that alone. No, those scars are amazing for the number of re-entries and the trauma. She's healing really well, and I think that is probably indicative of where she's at at this moment in time with her rehab, where she's at with her well-being. But she obviously looks after herself, because if you're not looking after your health, you won't heal as well. But that also shows that you're obviously you know, good at healing. A couple of years with a bit more sunshine on all of these, yeah. they will fade, fade, fade. She has got a bounce in the step that will get bouncier as she gets stronger. Despite all the hardship, Claire still has faith in humanity. The one thing that I could never have envisaged happening was the support from people that didn't even know me. they never met me before, but have written to me with such amazing support. Dear Claire, uh, you and officers like you are a credit to any force. Hopefully that you'll be back doing a job that you love. Uh, best wishes to you and your family. There are some amazing good people in this world. People have recognised that you don't do too bad a job in the police force. In 18 months, Claire has achieved the seemingly impossible and is now walking unaided. I think what I've got to realise is that, that I'm still the same person and that I'm proud of myself. I'm trying to go back to work with a better version of myself for my kids to be able to go. That was my mum. A few weeks later, and Claire's big moment has arrived. She's returning to work and will be working in the training department of Staffordshire Police. How are you feeling, Mum? A bit nervous. Hmm. But quite excited. Hmm. First time I've got my boots on. Let's see her. If they take care of me like they did before, there you go. You've got this. All ready? So I've just turned up uh, for work, but it's been a long old 18 months. I'm quite nervous, to be fair. Um, I've been... Uh, having butterflies the whole journey here. I think the first hurdle was getting into my uniform this morning uh, and actually coming into the uh, police headquarters. I think at this time, we all need to muck in. And I think that's the main thing, is that I want to feel useful. Here we go. Uh, wish me luck. She is. That was good. I need to get my boots off now. Oh. Change out my uniform, so. Yeah. Get my teacher hat on now. Yeah. I don't know. No.